Welcome to episode 272 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Rebecca Brandstetter about the neuroscience of co-thriving with students. Visit truthforteachers.com to get an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. My guest today is the school psychologist, Dr. Rebecca Brandstetter. She has been a good friend for over 10 years, and this past fall, we co-created our first resource together. It's called Reverse Educator Burnout, 10 Shifts to Help Educators Enjoy the Journey and Stay the Course, and it's designed to support everyone who works in K-12 schools. The course is set up in easily digestible 7-10 to minute videos. Rebecca, as the school psychologist, talks about the research and neuroscience of reversing burnout, and then I talk about the practical school application. Each module also has a guest expert who shares their unique perspective on reversing burnout. Rebecca and I believe in helping educators co-thrive with students. We find the overlap between what's best for kids and what's best for educators. So as you learn new skills through the course, you can teach the same strategies to your students. You can buy the course on your own, but it's really designed for school purchases. We want districts investing in their faculty's well-being and mental health, and this is a tool that can help. The course is half price now through March 10th of 2023. You can enroll at the discounted price via the link in the show notes. Group discounts for schools are also always available. Dr. Rebecca Brandsetter is on the show today to talk about co-thriving meaning how can educators thrive alongside students in the classroom? She is the creator of The Thriving School Psychologist and my co-creator in our new online professional development called Reverse Educator Burnout. Listen in as we talk about the science of thriving and how you and your students can experience more of it. So I want to start by addressing the elephant in the room. Almost everyone that I interview on this podcast is a current K-12 teacher because I myself am not. And I think it's important for resources designed for teachers to highlight the experiences and expertise of those who are actually doing that work every day. So when it comes to topics like burnout, there is rightful skepticism among some educators about how people who are not in the classroom can tell others how to avoid burnout in a job that they themselves aren't doing. And at the same time, I think it's difficult for classroom teachers and for those working in full-time school-based positions to devote the time and mental bandwidth to becoming an expert in all of the countless aspects of teaching that are essential to their job and have time to write articles, produce podcasts, courses, help their fellow educators become experts in things like neuroscience and mindset. So I do think that it's valuable for teachers to learn from people who devote their lives to the study of a particular topic that is relevant to the classroom. So for me, that's been mindset and productivity. I started learning about those things in my third year of teaching, which was 20 years ago. And I have devoted more time and energy to that in recent years because I no longer had that full-time classroom position that needed to be my top work priority. So I think I have valuable insights and perspectives to offer, obviously, or else I wouldn't be producing this podcast. And I believe you do too, Rebecca, or else you wouldn't be a guest. So to me, it's not that we know more than classroom teachers or that we know less than classroom teachers. We just have different insights and perspectives, and each perspective has value. So I would love for you to tell listeners about the expertise that you're tapping into in your unique lens on neuroscience and how it can help educators. Thanks, Angela. So I think what you brought up is extremely important. Um, I know that when I graduated from UC Berkeley as a brand new school psychologist 20 years ago, I was armed with a ton of research and a ton of, um, you know, sort of ideas about how to prevent burnout and how to do my job well. And then I got into the reality and I was like, wow, this is not the same. <laughs> and I think there's an analogy that um, someone used that research is really like being in the, the hot house, right? Um, if you're gardening or something, we put it under perfect conditions and we see what flourishes and what grows. And then I was like, well, I'm not in a hot house. I'm in a hot mess. Like, how can I <laughs> you know, really apply what I know in research into reality? So I've spent the past 20 years really trying to be, you know, an ambassador for research, but in the context of reality. And my passion really is bridging that research to reality 
gap. So another way to think of it is, you know, actually, I don't know if you remember this, but when I first went from being a full-time school psychologist to doing what I do now full-time, which is um, supporting educators, school psychologists, and parents across the country, um, I was like, I don't know, am I not going to have any street cred anymore? <laughs> and I don't know if you remember telling this, but you're like, yes, you, you had 20 years of school psych experience and you don't have amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> Great like, point. That's correct. I, I very much remember what it's like to be a full-time school psychologist and being stressed. So I think that what the message I want to give out to folks who have that healthy skepticism is that you want to look for people, and I think you fall in this category, Angela, of people who have street-level data and satellite-level data. What I mean by street-level data is that lived experience of the day in, day out of teaching, of being a school psychologist, of having all of the stressors, but then also that satellite level view, looking above, hovering above everything and saying, okay, well, here's what the research says about this thing. And how can we bridge that? So that's what I've been doing um, in a real time sort of laboratory <laughs> with my thriving school psychologist community is I bring the research and then we get on Zoom, we connect on each other and they say, well, here is something that's new that's happening in our system, some new hot mess. And we talk about ways to bridge. This is what we know about the research, but how can we bring it to our everyday life? So you get the street level data, what's happening in the schools, but then the satellite level, because as you mentioned, it's really hard to hover above yourself when you're in it. It's hard to look beyond the weeds when you're in them. So I think it's a both and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so let's get into what it means to thrive. What, what, is, what does thriving look like in one's life and in one's job? Tell us about what you mean by that term and what neuroscience tells us about the markers of thriving. So um, for those of you who have uh, aren't familiar, um, I actually began my quest into diving into the research on um, how to move from surviving to thriving um, as a really a decade long me search project, <laughs> I say me search, mm -hmm. but it was really research, but it was in the spirit of, I was ready to quit. I wanted, I was burnt out. Um, I was crying on, on the way home from work and I love my students, but I really hated my job and I knew something had to change. So when I started diving into the research, um, it was really a, about how to figure out how to make it in a system that's very challenging. So what I uncovered was really four pillars of thriving, and this was done through some street level data of interviewing uh, school psychologists who've been in the field for 30 plus years. And at that moment in my life, I was like, how, <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, I was so burnt out. I couldn't even imagine being in it for 30 years. Um, and I know there's a lot of folks out there who can feel like they're just doing time until retirement and, and they don't have that joy that they had. So I wanted to know what, what it would take to thrive. And so I uncovered four pillars of thriving um, that applied to school psychologists and educators um, in systems that are challenging. And, and, you know, one of them is sort of things that you talk about a lot, which is streamlining your workflow, getting organized, getting systems in place to automate and eliminate bureaucratic nonsense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the second pillar is really around cultivating passion projects based on your strength and being able to operate in your zone of genius that amazing thing that you and only you do. You know, when you, <laughs> I use this analogy, you know, when you find the perfect gift for someone and you give it to them and you can't wait for them to open it and you're like, here, let me open it for you. <laughs> you're just so excited because it's perfect. You have a passion project out there, folks who are listening, deep inside you that you know that you have to give and you can't wait to give it. But maybe you're bogged down with other things. So it's been sidelined. So having passion projects, Another one is connecting with others, that great juicy connection with students, but also collaborating with other folks who get it. Um, and then lastly, this is the one that we'll talk about most today, which is the fourth pillar of practicing the science of burnout prevention. And I studied, I really geeked out a lot on habit formation and the neuroscience of well-being. Um, and I'm actually pretty excited to announce that I have a new personality test called the Thrivogram, where you can find out mm -hmm. what pillar, um, you know, helps you motivate and get through things and what pillar maybe you need to cultivate a little bit more. It's a strength-based assessment. Um, and it, you can identify what, um, what neuroscientists scientists call flow. Are you familiar with flow? Mm, yes. So flow is that feeling where you're like, wow, all this time just passed and I was having so much fun, I didn't even notice. It's like that deep dive flow. What gets you in that flow? It helps identify that. 
and then using that information to cultivate what we talk about in our online course together, the thrive ratio, which is what is that delicious balance of things that lift you up, things you love um, with some of the obligations that you have that maybe aren't in your zone of genius or things you don't enjoy and really using the science of micro habits to make it all come together. Okay. Say more about that. So essentially when we think about our students, we want to tap into their strengths, right? Um, but we often don't turn that onto ourselves. We don't even really think about what are our strengths. And so the first step really is to assess what are my strengths. And I know that both you and I have taken some surveys on our strengths and um, you know, I believe yours was creativity and perspective. So, yes. Yeah. So when I took this assessment, my top strength was love of learning. And my second one was forgiveness. And so when I'm in a stressful situation, I try to really conjure up those strengths. So um, for those of you who know the special education world, we have a lot of really uh, contentious meetings, hard meetings, IEP meetings. And so right before those meetings, I will say, okay, what are my strengths? My strengths are love of learning. So I'm going to learn something about how to present difficult news well. I am going to learn something about advocates who come at me and criticize my report and how to handle that. Um, I will also um, show forgiveness for a parent who maybe is coming in hot and very angry with the results and feels unheard. And it's not directed at me. Um, but it is. And so how can I forgive that parent? Because they're just coming from a place of wanting the best for their kid. So you can really think about your strengths. And that's what the Thrivogram is all about. And I, I'm actually co-creating it with um, Dr. Byron McClure and Dr. Kelsey Reed, um, so that we can make sure that we're focusing in our educators on what's strong and not what's wrong. So good. When we were um, co-creating our course um, last fall, you introduced me to a term that I hadn't heard before, which is co-thriving. And it just struck me immediately like, yes, this is the goal. And in fact, we almost put it in the title. The title ended up being about uh, reverse educator burnout, 10 shifts to help educators enjoy the journey and stay the course. But initially, we both liked co-thriving so much, we almost put it in there because I feel like that is the goal. We want educators to be able to co-thrive along with students so schools can be a supportive place where everyone flourishes. So talk to us about what it looks like to co-thrive with kids. Well, first, I just want to name something that is evolved in our system. So when I first started out as a school psychologist 20 years ago, you know, people were really kind of talking to us about preventing burnout by like, tap into your bigger why, right? Mm -hmm. About the kids, everything for the kids. So I was burning myself out for the kids. Um, And then it kind of evolved to, you need to self-care more, right? Take self-care Sunday, I swear, if you say self-care to a teacher right now, <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, really? Some like lavender bath is really going to help me right now. Um, so there's a sort of perception that, you know, if you're burning out, you're, you're it's some sort of self-care fail, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not doing enough self-care. And that feels like a burden. So what I'm seeing now that I think you've always been a champion for, which is why I think we geeked out so hard on this course together, <laughs> is that it's more than just self-care activities you do after work. It's mindset shifts and it's things that we do during the day when the stress is actually happening rather than an off the job proposition. So one of the things that I'm super passionate about is about the science of burnout prevention, but also the science of wellness, the science of happiness. You talk about how what's good for kids is good for us and there's that overlap. Well, happiness helps your students. It helps you be a better teacher. It helps you be a better human. And so one of the things that I I love to share is Barbara Fredrickson's broaden and build theory. Are you familiar with Barbara Fredrickson? I'm not. So she's the one cultivated sort of this um, ratio of positive to negative. So one corrective um, piece of information needs to be counteracted with, you know, three to five positives to kind of maintain. Uh, Yeah. We know about that research. So what she actually has looked at her research is around happiness, promoting the following things. So as I'm going to share this research, I want you to think about would this help me feel better as a human and be um, an, a better educator? Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so happiness promotes this. Positive emotions, like happiness, broaden our minds. We're better problem solvers. We're more creative. It literally expands your peripheral vision so you can see things you otherwise wouldn't see. And that can be opportunities. 
you organize information faster and you retain information better. Do any of those seem handy in your life and in your work? <laughs> All of them, Definitely. right? Mm-hmm. The other one is positive emotions build resources, emotional resources. They have better physical health when you are happier. You have lower anxiety, lower stress, increased focus, increased connection and social bonds, and a term that psychologists love to name something and make it sound fancy, positive resonance and embodied rapport. (laughs) Okay, I love that phrase. What that means basically is when you're connecting with someone and you're vibing, you're enjoying it. You're both enjoying your time together and you want that for yourself and your students. So being happy isn't just like a nice to have like, oh, that's nice. Being happy is cool. It actually makes you broadens your cognitive skills and expands your emotional resources. I don't know about you, but think about the last time you were anxious or upset or worried. You're internal, right? You're in your head. You're not available for the people around you. So when you're happier, you have more social bonds, more connection because you have more availability. Mm, That's good. And so now we also talked a little bit about co-thriving. So first off, that's, you know, one of the things is learning and build your cognitive skills and your emotional skills. And that's in and of itself a worthy goal. But as we've talked about before, and we talk about in our course, you know, I want to give you like a little spooky sci-fi lesson Mm -hmm. (laughs) about mirror neurons. So essentially this is the foundation for something I'll talk about for co-thriving, which is sounds very similar, which is co-regulation. So co-regulation is when the nervous system of one person can up or down regulate the nervous system of another. So it's sort of like when your classroom is in you know, chaos and a lot of energy and you bring the calm, your students are actually evolutionarily pre-programmed to match your emotion. When your class is too low energy, what do you do? You bring it up with your energy. You're like, get a little more excited, a little more animated and your students' energy comes up. So the spooky sci-fi lesson is this. I don't know if you know this, but if you uh, interact with another human, (laughs) you, this is all subconscious. This is all very much, you don't even realize it happens. It happens in milliseconds. You're evolutionarily pre-programmed to detect the mood of another. And within 0.33 milliseconds, you start to match it. Hmm. Okay, so here's the spookiest thing of all. (laughs) We know that stress is contagious in a very subterranean way. Have you ever walked into a meeting, Angela, and you're like, no one says a word, and you're like, something funky in here. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. Or you walk into another teacher's classroom, and you're like, this is a joyful place to be. No one's Mm -hmm. really said anything. It's the vibe. So that vibe is neuroscience. Those are mirror neurons. So the idea is when you bring a calm, regulated nervous system into your school, into your classroom, not only does it feel good for you, but you're helping your students too, because they are evolutionarily pre-programmed to match your emotions. Talk to us more about co-regulation. So one of the things that one of my, my good friends, Kathy, has said before is we have a lot of interventions for students' wellness, right? We have curriculum and we have morning meetings and we have mindfulness lessons and things like that. But my friend Kathy says, like, your regulated nervous system is a research-based intervention for students. Mm. So what we need to think about is that not tending to yourself and being calm and regulated and in a, a happy psychological mood is actually a gift you give your students. Now, here's the challenge. Because of mirror neurons, you're also going to be triggered when they are acting out, yes. when they are angry, when they, you know, if you ask a student and this happened, you know, a, a school psychologist who in my community um, said that she asked a student to write their name on their paper and they flipped over the desk on her. Okay. So we are not all Zen masters. <laughs> right. We are going to be triggered by that. Right. So What we've talked about a lot in our course, and you probably, you know, interviewing others is this sort of taking these mindful pauses when you're triggered, even just a minute of a deep breath before responding, that space between stimulus and response gives you time to respond and not react. Hmm. So if you go into your classroom and kids are acting out 
or there's, they're stressed out. You're going to feel that because of science <laughs> neurons. So if you can take a mindful pause before responding to that energy, you're going to be better able to help your students with regulation. It's, it's really a gift you give yourself and your students. The other thing I want to talk about in, in terms of the, the neuroscience around this is because of mirror neurons, kids, by the way, just by design, are, are egocentric, which means they're thinking about themselves, not egotistical, that's different. Egocentric mm-hmm. means they think things are about them. Okay. And if you remember when you were a kid, you probably thought everything was about you because that's just how your kind of development is. So if you, as a teacher, as a school psychologist, as a social worker, whoever's listening, if you're having a, you had a series of unfortunate events <laughs> in the morning before you went to school, we've all had those and you get to school and your classroom is there and you don't let folks know what's going on, the kids are going to think it's about them. So there's this concept I love called the emotional whiteboard. We walk around all day long and we almost have this whiteboard on us that, you know, our feelings are written all over it, whether we say it or not. It's like when someone's like, are you fine? And you're like, I'm fine. Like, they're not fine. (laughs) You can tell. And your kids can tell when you're stressed. So one way that you can build psychological safety in your classroom is if you're having a stressful moment, you don't need to share all of the details of your series of unfortunate events. But what if you model for your students to clear that emotional whiteboard? Because anxiety and stress is written all over you anyway, whether you say it or not, they're going to think it's about them. So what you can say is, look, you know, Miss Angela has had a really rough morning. Raise your hand if you've had a rough morning before. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is before we get started, um, we're all just going to take, you know, three mindful breaths together. And it's really, I need this right now because right now I'm so stressed out and I'm in brainstem. Brainstem is this part of your brain here and you can touch your neck where you're in fight, flight, or freeze. And when you're in that, you're not in your frontal lobe where learning occurs. So, Let's just, just for Miss Angela, (laughs) let's all just take some deep breaths together. (sighs) And I'm feeling a little stressed. Okay, I feel better. I feel like I'm ready to engage. So what have you done? You've only, you've calmed your nervous system. You've made, um, you've modeled for them what to do and you've built psychological safety. It's a three for, is that a word? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Three for one. And that's emotional whiteboard, you call that? The emotional whiteboard, clearing your Mm -hmm. emotional whiteboard. Um, it builds psychological safety and it helps your students. Um, another thing that I know you talk a lot about, um, and I really love to share neuroscience backed principles. Um, this is something that we cognitively get, but we often don't act on. So when I talked about micro habits, this is kind of one of the things. So we talk about how rest is productive. Rest is not a reward for a job well done. Um, we have better productivity, better physical health and increased creativity when we're rested. But as you know, and teachers out there listening know, it's really hard to shut it down at the end of the day. It's really hard. It's more like a dial and not a switch. You can't just like, I'm home now. I'm no longer thinking about work, right? It's really difficult. And so what I like to do is think about these sort of mind hacks, things you can tell yourself at the end of the day to help you shut down. So first, knowing the neuroscience, have you heard of the default mode network? No, I haven't. So the default mode network is the part of your brain that works on problems when you're rested. Ah, uh, okay. So have you ever had a problem and you go to sleep and you wake up and you're like, oh. Yes. Now. <laughs> yes. Because your brain had a hot second without any other data coming in to work on that problem. It's the reason good ideas come in the shower sometimes. Mm-hmm. You're not actively thinking about that. Or maybe after summer break, you're like, oh, here's a new way I can work with my students because you're rested. So rest is productive. You're more creative. You get more of those aha moments. So we know this for fact is neuroscience. Um, but how do you at the end of the day, shut it off? So for me, you know, I have that, I, you know, I I was a school psychologist for 20 years, so I don't have amnesia. I remember the moment (laughs) where you look at your work bag on Friday and you're like, should I, shouldn't I, Mm. I bring it home, but I'll bring it home and that'll sit in the side of my house and haunt me from the corner and I won't do it. And I'll feel bad about myself (laughs) or I will do it. And then I'll feel bad about myself because I didn't practice self care. Right? So how can you get out of that trap? So what I would tell myself looking at that bag, rested, happy minds are more productive. It's science. Rest and happy minds are more productive. 
And so it would give myself permission to leave it there. I also love the mantra that I use with my school psychologists all the time. There's the greatest myth, and maybe teachers have it too, where, oh, after this week, things will settle down. Yep. (laughs) Or I'll just get caught up this weekend, and then I'll be caught up. Yep. But guess what? Kids are never done. (laughs) So you will never be done with work. I hate to break it to you. And if you keep working until you're done, you'll never stop working. That's right. So I love these little mantras, just kids are never done, so I'll never be done. (laughs) Rest and happy minds are productive. Now, we talk a lot about in our course as well about, you know, it's one thing to just have these hard, rigid boundaries, like I'll never bring work home. But then if you're at home and you're thinking about work and it would make you feel better to simply finish something, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's it's muscling yourself into doing something that you don't want to do. If you want to finish something at home, great, do that. But it has to be done sort of mindfully, like you're making a choice. It's not just a default mode. And we talk about like, be where your feet are in our course. Mm -hmm. So if you're at work and you're stressing about home or you're at home and you're stressing about work, I have this all the time. So I have kids and, you know, I want to have like downtime with my kids and and they want to watch some, you know, show together. And my mind is on work and I just need to get that one email out or I'm not going to be able to focus on the movie. So I'll just excuse myself and say, oh, I'm going to just do this one email and I'll be right back. And then I'll be fully present. It's when stress comes from being divided, pulled in many different directions at once. It wasn't even the stress of the email. It was that I was like muscling myself to enjoying family time when I really wasn't. I had to get that <laughs> off my plate. And so another sort of mind hack that I love to share is, is it urgent or is it anxiety? I asked myself this, when is that email urgent or am I just kind of worried about it? And then it kind of gives you a pause before responding. I'm loving all these specific practices that are backed by neuroscience. So good. Um, I know you also talk a lot about gratitude and the research behind that and how that can help us co-thrive. Tell us about the role of of gratitude here. Yeah. So I also just want to name that like when I say gratitude or like uh, in in trainings I do, I say, what's something you're grateful for? Like I can almost see like a collective eye roll. I don't know if you see this. But like, it's like, oh, it sounds vague. It sounds like, oh yeah, I got my health. I got my family. <laughs> yes. Right. It feels heavy. So yes. I think of gratitude as what is the very best thing that's happened today? Mm. You know, gratitude lives in like these micro moments. Like, you know, when your cat snuggles up on you and then the little tail brushes your face and you can snuzzle with it. Or when a kid in the hallway is like, is it my turn, Dr. B? Like, I want to come back again, right? These tiny little micro moments, if you stack those up, it can literally alter your brain. This is fascinating research. So when you practice gratitude, it increases dopamine, uh, serotonin, which are all sort of happiness neurotransmitters, keeps your gray matter functioning increases stimulation to your hypothalamus, which I don't know if you know, but that regulates stress mm-hmm. and it boosts your immunity. So I mean, if there was a drug, like y'all would be taking that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's really about cultivating get gratitude. Now, because of biology, it's very hard. Um, Dr. Rick Hansen is a positive psychologist who talks about how the brain is like a Velcro for negative and Teflon for positive. Mm -hmm. We are just evolutionally pre-programmed to scan for danger. Now it's not saber tooth tigers anymore. It's psychological danger. Do danger. Do they like me? Am I, do I feel safe? Do I feel psychologically safe? Um, Those kinds of things our brains are constantly scanning for. So what I like to do to trick my brain into scanning for positive is pairing it Um, It's called anchors. So you're more likely to do a new habit when you do it with something that's automatic and already a habit. So for Mm -hmm. instance, at the end of the day, you're in the teacher's parking lot and you maybe just had a day, (laughs) a day to remember and not in a good way. Um, You can click your seatbelt and you say, what clicked today? And scan your brain for a moment that was good. Um, At the end of the day, look at your, your, uh, your list your email or your, um, your to-do list and, and reframe it. So, Oh, this is not my to-do list. This is a contribution list. Look at all the people I get to help. I love helping turning the meaning, sorry, turning something mundane into meaningful as a school psychologist. And maybe you've read my read reports like this. They're really long, really long reports that we have to write. And maybe teachers have really, you know, a lot of things that they have to do that feels really mundane to them. And so I tried to trick my brain into making it meaningful. So it's like, I'm not writing up 
a psychoeducational report with statistics. I'm helping a student with dyslexia not feel dumb. Hmm. You see how that makes that sort of mundane thing more meaningful? And then lastly, you know, we want to create a, a culture in our schools and in our, um, in our classrooms where gratitude is just sort of baked into the DNA. One of the ways that um, I've seen this done is through something called the praise prism. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. So the praise prism, um, Sean Acor is a really fantastic um, uh, positive psychologist. And this is something that I, I learned from him, which is when you receive praise, that feels good, right? Have you ever had, do you have a smile file? Like, you know, things that people have emailed you or uh, little notes that kids have given you that just like, oh, that's, that's awesome. And it feels great, right? Um, so if you don't have a smile file in your inbox, that's another way to do it. Like <laughs> put all those parent emails in there are people like you really help my child and read those on a bad day. Um, so the praise prism is this. When you receive praise, if you can give it back out, it magnifies it. So, you know, for mm-hmm. instance, um, you know, someone's like, that was a really great psychoeducational report. I really felt like I understood the kid. And I'm like, wow, I really couldn't have done it without that 11 billion long survey that you filled out as a teacher. <laughs> you guys familiar with the Basque? I really couldn't have done it because I got, you know, more information about how the kid is in the classroom, which is way different than one-on-one. And then the parent is witnessing it too. So there's a collaboration. So I'm going to give you a non-school example of the praise prism and how it helps the person giving it. It helps the person receiving it and it helps a witness. So you've met my daughter, my youngest daughter, mm-hmm. um, when you came out to do my course and she was at the toy store <laughs> and she saw this little mail truck. It's like a little tiny toy truck as a mail truck. She's like, I want to give this to our mailman. And I was like, what's so <laughs> sure. you think about it, mailman, just like you're in the background and you don't really notice or think about them. Your mail just comes, right? You notice when they don't come. Um, and so she put it in the mailbox, this little mail truck. And it was like, thanks for being our mailman, which is adorable in and of itself. She felt good, right? <laughs> So we like spied on the mailman as he got it. Like, and he, he pulls it out of our mailbox and he like his face, like I thought he was going to cry. Like he was so touched and he like put it on his dashboard and then he wrote her a thank you note and she was delighted. And then she wrote him a thank you note. Thank you. For the thank you. note. And, like, I got to witness it all. And it just started from like one little gesture And so she was praising him and then he praised her and then I witnessed it. And so in our schools and in our communities, if you can cultivate a praise prism, and again, it's that micro habit of someone praises you and you praise it back out Mm -hmm. and then it creates that climate. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing is, I feel like with these kinds of things, like the more you do it, the more it becomes habitual. You know, you get that, that positive sentiment override where, you know, you're, you're trained to look for the positive and you notice the positive because I think when you're first starting out, it can be really easy to think, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, show great, show gratitude, you know, think about the good things, reframing. And if you're in a really low mood, that kind of stuff is hard to do. It, it may not happen that day, but I found that if I can like sort of let myself off the hook. It's okay to have a low mood. It's okay to have a day where you just don't feel like looking for the positive. You don't feel like, you know, finding things you're grateful for. Then if I have a better day the next day, really try to cultivate those habits then. And then I feel like the more that I practice these kinds of habits, the more good days I have, and then the more habitual it becomes. So that those low days, those low mood days where it's like, I just can't get myself into the mood to do this. Like I just kind of want to be cynical and complain and just be in a bad mood <laughs> are fewer and far between. And I, I just, I will never forget now this, this little mailbox truck example. I think that is, that's the perfect example of how something so small, if you can do that when you're in the right mood, just cultivate so many more positive emotions so you can show up like that more often. And that to me is thriving. And that is co-thriving with the people around you too. It, that is such a sweet story. Yeah. And what you mentioned is absolutely true. This is not about toxic positivity. This is not about ignoring negative feelings and just pretending like everything is great. Honor those feelings. I'm having those feelings. And at the same time, there is probably something that has happened in the day that's positive and your brain loves patterns. So your brain will start to scan for positive when you start to put your attention on it and you can routinize it too. Like I think habit formation is about routinizing. Um, so I don't know if you know this about me, but you probably do because you spent some time with me is that I'm an absolute 
coffee fiend. Like I love coffee is my love language. I love coffee. I, I have it every morning and I don't even need to be awake to be able to be like, that's a habit well formed. So I pair coffee with gratitude. Like I'm, it's as it's brewing, I'm like, okay, what am I grateful for today? And so you can just do these small micro habits, but then your brain loves patterns. It's called priming. It's called positive priming. And you may have noticed this when like, maybe you're, you're interested in, um, you know, getting a new car, right. Of some brand or variety. And then everywhere you look, there is that car again, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're primed. Your brain is like, Oh wait, we're thinking about a car. So let's look for that everywhere. (laughs) And so your brain is, will start to look for um, other moments of gratitude, even in the low moments. It's, it's really kind of exciting to think about how you can, you know, um, trick neuro, <laughs> trick neuroscience um, <laughs> into scanning for positive in really challenging circumstances. And I do want to say it's rough. It, educator burnout is real and it is not about just pretending like everything is fine, but it is about um, understanding yourself and what you need, tapping into your strengths and kind of being the change you want for your students and in the world. Um, because we know that, you know, and this is sort of the, one of the things that we hear all the time, but, you know, doesn't always land, which is that self-care isn't selfish. I like to close out the show with what I call a takeaway truth, something important that you want everyone to remember in the week ahead. So what is something that you wish every teacher understood about co-thriving with students? I think that, and this is another little phrase that I, I picked up from another therapist, which is being centered in yourself is not selfish. When you are grounded in what you need, you have healthy boundaries, you are you know, practicing the science of happiness and burnout prevention. I think that's a worthy goal in and of itself, but there's a bonus. (laughs) Just like I got to witness the mail truck. You're actually modeling for your kids, your students, healthy coping strategies. What a gift you're Mm -hmm. inspiring educators around you. It's contagious. You know, I said, stress is contagious. Guess what? So are positive emotions. You can really support a positive, healthy climate amongst your coworkers. And the last take home truth is something from our course. Um, we have, if you don't know, it's all, um, a, we, we didn't want to make just a, you know, a regular old PD. We wanted to make it fun. Um, so we have a theme about a road trip in our course on the road to thrive town. And so we left that course and I want to leave you all with no matter how bumpy the road is, you can thrive. <laughs> 